Okay. Okay, so we can probably get started. Um, thank you all for joining our March Local Government Committee meeting. My name is Valerie. I'm the Outreach Coordinator for the Peconic Estuary Partnership. Um, we just want to let you all know that this will be recorded uh, so that people that are not um, able to be present can watch it uh, in the future. Um, if you do have any questions throughout the presentation, please either uh, click to raise your hand or type your question in the chat and we'll get around to you. Um, and yeah, let's get started. Uh, we have very gratefully um, our former local government committee chair, uh, Jim Colligan here today. So thank you so much for joining us, Jim. While we're uh, without an next LGC chair, I would appreciate if you could start us off with an introduction. Uh, thank you so much. Sure. Um, you know, the first thing I woke up to this morning was uh, I was watching CNN and I, I watched a story from Massachusetts about the uh, shoreline that the community there of uh, several hundred homes had spent, um, you know, over a million dollars to replace the uh, sand dunes that uh, need, they needed to protect their homes. And of course, the last few storms that have gone up the coast have eliminated all of that work. And now yeah. the dilemma is, uh, and by the way, they truck it in. They don't They don't actually dredge from, from outside in from the water. They truck that sand in. So it's pretty costly. And now who's going to pay for the, you know, for the, again, this is, and there are still people in the community that doubt uh, sea rise, you know, and global warming and, and that whole thing. So uh, for anybody that's still doubting it, there's just no doubt in my mind living here on Shelter Island, only for a short period of time of 17 years, that I've seen a vast change in sea rise. Um, the flooding here is, is you know, and again, I, I do a lot of birding along Dune Road. Yeah. It's real. I mean, it's obviously an ongoing issue that's progressively getting worse. And, um, you know, I think we have to, as Kevin often said, we have to make better decisions, uh, you know, across the board. Mother nature is mother nature, but I don't think we're gonna be able to reverse um, global warming, um, you know, it took literally decades and decades, maybe centuries of abuse to get to the spot that uh, we're not going to just in a matter of 10 or 15 years be able to, to turn the tide. Obviously, we should have started, you know, sooner, but we didn't. And we're learning the hard way. And I think that here on the east end of Long Island, all our local governments are going to be dealing with these issues. And we really have to start making more intelligent decisions because money is not endless. So that's my opening to the to the uh, for today's meeting. Um, <clears throat> but I think these harder decisions, you know, people don't like to make them, but we need to start to make them. Oh, thank you, Jim. Uh, so should we do a quick round of intros? Uh, so we have what. The newest people on the group are from the county. So why don't we start with uh, the county execs uh, folks and then go to legislators? I don't, I, I'm not sure I know exactly who's on. So uh, yeah. please proceed. Me neither, but I'll start. Um, my name is Jennifer Youngston. I'm the new deputy county executive taking over for uh, Peter Scully, working on sewers, clean water, solid waste, and everything Ed is throwing my way. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Jen. Uh, Catherine, go ahead. Sure. Hi, I'm Legislator Catherine Stark uh, for the first legislative district. Thank you very much. And not new to this because you were staff for a bit too, so you're not you're not a newbie. Just twenty eight years. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, very good. Rookie. All right. So listen, I'm not running this meeting, but I just wanted to get the introductions going. So thank you, Kevin. I'm sorry. Keep going, Jim. No, I, I'm pretty much uh, pretty much uh, through this. Um, you know, uh, and I, I'm, I'm uh, a New York State New York State Assembly Member Jody Giglio here. Ah, Happy to go. be with you all. Thank I'll you, be Jody. listening in, and I will also be. Um, we did get a letter off, which I forwarded to Joyce. Uh, requesting the 750000 for the Peconic Estuary Program, and we'll be debating the one-house budgets hopefully Thursday, so hopefully funding will be in there. Awesome. I didn't know, I, I'm still looking to see the gallery, so I, I still can't tell who's on fully, but thank you for joining us, even if in yeah. your car. Yeah. Sure. I can read through the list if um we'd like to sure. everyone introduce themselves. Thanks, Thanks Valerie. 
Okay, sure. Um, so uh, first, um, a woman who needs no introduction, but Carol, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Uh, I'm Carol Brown. Um, formerly, years and years ago, from um, the Huntington Conservation Board, I'm now South Holds um, Conservation Advisory Council's um, Assistant Coordinator. And uh, I was up in Albany with everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me. And insofar as um, climate change and sea level rise, one of the things that we're going to be discussing at our meeting, our CAC meeting tonight, is putting in an algorithm for um, for uh, our wetlands um, applications that it's not just 100 feet back, but based on the... Um, the projected sea level rise, we'd like to see um, a lot of things a lot further back, um, especially since one of the properties I'm looking at today wants to put a pool in a flood zone. Um, I guess I just don't understand people, but we are going to be using as a template this the um, Shelter Island um, Homeowner's Guide that uh, we are going to use to uh, inform um, current um, waterfront people as well as future. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Uh, Celia, can you introduce yourself? Yes, I was just about to. Mm -hmm. I'm a new trustee on the Board of Trustees for East Hampton Town, and I wanted to be sure to be here to keep up to date. <laughs> Thank you so much for attending. And Tommy John, can you introduce yourself? Good morning, everybody. Tommy John Scavone. I'm a council member in the town of Southampton. I am the liaison to our sustainability committee. In addition to that, I'm also the liaison to our community preservation fund, both open space and water quality. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. And Bob, next. Well, good morning, Bob DeLuca with Group for the East End. Thank you. Uh, Chris Clapp. Hi there, uh, Chris Clapp. I'm your uh, vice chair of the Citizens Advisory Committee. Um, I'll just leave it at that, among other things. And Michael? Hello, everybody. Council Member Michael Iasilli, also with Southampton Town. Um, I am also co liaison with Tommy John Scavone to Sustainability and CPF. Really happy to be on. I'm very aware of Dr. Joyce Novak's wonderful work with PEP. Um, I was also the legislative aide uh, with County Legislator Bridge of Fleming prior to this. And um, I also know um, all the great work of Kevin McDonald with the Nature Conservancy and very much in support of the work here. So happy to be here with everyone. Great. Thank Bye. you so much. And Dean, go ahead. Who else, Jen? Um, I'll, I'll go. Um, hi, I, I'm Tom Flight. I'm the new... Uh, board member for East Hampton Town. Oh. Okay, great. Uh, Meg Larson. Meg Larson, I'm on the town board for the town of Shelter Island. Um, I'm pretty up to speed. Jim Colligan did a really good job keeping us informed of what's going on. So I'm gonna kind of be stepping in for him as the liaison to this committee. So looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Big shoes to fill, but. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, next we have Michelle Golden. Hi everyone, Michelle Golden, uh, DEC Division of Water in Albany. Met some of you when you were up here in Albany, uh, but nice to see everyone. Nice to see you too. Uh, next we have Ryan Ferguson. Um, he, it's okay if uh, he doesn't want to introduce himself. It's one of your- um, he, he, doesn't have, he doesn't have a microphone. He's okay, gotcha. Line. He's from well, the- office. Hello, Ryan. Uh, next, we have Susan. You had introduced yourself earlier, but you can go ahead again for those that weren't here. Are you asking me, Valerie? Yes, correct. Oh, okay. Well, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm a former East Hampton Town trustee, and I was invited by Joyce and Valerie and you, uh, Jade, to uh, come back and join you as a citizen because I still want to continue mm. being involved and help out where I can. And I'm looking forward to the information um, and the uh, um, expansion of the restoration of the Akabonic Harbor salt marsh, which we started when we did our mosquito larvae water sampling. And I know most of you here, so I'm thrilled to see you all again. Thank Great. you. 
Thank you so much. And last, we have Terry. Mm. Uh, Hi, good morning, Terry Diot, um, North Haven Village trustee, and I am leading our um, North Haven Water Quality Committee. So happy to be here this morning. Great, thank you so much. So a quick overview of our agenda today. Uh, thank you so much, Jim, for your introduction. Uh, for the newer folks, I'm going to be giving an overview of PEP and the National Estuary Program. Joyce will talk about uh, congressional budget details. Uh, the whole staff will give um, PEP updates. Uh, then we have some tools that we'll touch on for local governments. Uh, but first, I'd like to introduce uh, the rest of the PEP staff. So. Uh, Joyce, I don't believe you introduced yourself. Can you go ahead? Absolutely. I am Joyce Novak. I'm the executive director of PEP. Okay. Uh, Jade? Hi, everyone. My name is Jade Bonnell. I'm the Coastal Resilience and Communities Coordinator for PEP. It's good to see you all. Okay, great. And Rachel? Hi, I'm Rachel Friedman. I'm the new Outreach Assistant Coordinator for the Peconic Estuary Partnership. Okay. So uh, PEP, uh, the Peconic Estuary Partnership, is uh, part of the National Estuary Program. There are 28 of these estuaries of national significance that each have a program that supports them. Uh, we're authorized by Section 320 of the Clean Water Act. We're EPA-funded, non-regulatory, uh, place-based program. And the mission is to protect and restore water quality, ecological integrity uh, of these critical estuaries. So these projects and priorities are driven by local communities, uh, provide trusted technical support and roles, and have a real big emphasis on community partnership uh, within those areas. So PEP was recognized by Congress as an estuary program in 1993. Uh, so PEP did turn 30 years old last year. Very exciting. Uh, and just a breakdown of the area. You're all from here. I'm sure that you're familiar. But there is over 125,000 land acres, uh, over 158,000 surface water acres, 453 miles of shoreline, 100,000 year-round residents and uh, almost 300,000 residents during summer. So a very unique area. And here we have just a breakdown and a map of the estuary and watershed. Uh, the estuary, of course, being that body of water where the fresh water from land mixes with the salt water from the ocean. And the watershed being the land of uh, the area of land that drains into any particular body of water. So our decisions are guided by our comprehensive conservation management plan. The last was created in 2020. Um, <clears throat> this guides all of our priorities and our work. And we have four main objectives. Those are strong partnerships, resilient communities, <clears throat> clean water, and a healthy ecosystem. So our governance uh, structure is shown in this graph here. And uh, we want to emphasize that all of PEP spending and all of our projects are guided by the policy and the management committees. They guide all of our work. So your role here in the local government committee is to speak amongst yourselves, figure out what your priorities are, emphasize those during these meetings, and then that local government committee chair brings those opinions back to the management committee and makes votes that uh, reflect the opinions of the people in this committee. <clears throat> so it's very important to show up and vocalize what your priorities are. Uh, now I'm gonna pass it over to Joyce uh, to do a brief uh, budget overview. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm just going to give you the general overview um, of our budget for the coming year. Um, currently, the federal and state budgets are not final, so I'll be discussing what we are in appropriations bills for, what we had last year, and what our hopes are for the future. To be clear, uh, we're an EPA-funded program, but that funding requires local match. Um, and all of the estuary programs, in addition to just matching one-to-one, -one, aim to leverage at least 
$10 to every $1. Some programs uh, are able to leverage as much as $24 to every $1. Um, so we're really ambitious programs. Um, and we do this in a series of ways through uh, local governments, state governments, and through um, uh, donations and fundraising. So currently for our budget, the national estuary programs are in the congressional appropriation bill for $850,000. This is the same amount that we got last year in FY23. Uh, the House bill had us increase to 875, but the more recent uh, congressional bill uh, has us back at 850,000. As you're all probably aware, this is uh, a very tumultuous um, couple of years we're having in Congress. So we're quite happy to uh, remain at 850, considering the EPA's total budget was slashed by over 10%, uh, which is really significant on a federal level. So we're happy to be at 850,000 and have continuing congressional support. However, I remind everybody we are authorized to receive up to a million. So Congress can make that decision. Um, and we are hoping they do that before our authorization is yeah. renewal in two years. Currently in the New York state budget, um, we are receiving $550,000. I know Jody Giglio is on the call. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman Giglio, for supporting an increase to $750,000. Um, I did see last night uh, that the Senate uh, was proposing five fifty, dollars but as you said, negotiations um, are happening. So we have strong support in the Assembly, and we are um, helpful, uh, hopeful. Um, but the final budget, of course, is due April 1st, and I want to extend a big thank you to everybody who came to Albany with us. Next slide, please. And then locally, uh, in 2021, we started to uh, see a contribution of the Community Preservation Funds. So um, that is something that we are allowed to receive under the state and then each individual town Community Preservation Fund uh, law. Um, in 2022, uh, again, our federal contribution was 850,000, sorry, in 2023. And so we will look to match that again over the next three years. So what we're proposing to the East End Towns is a new three-year request. Uh, we usually do this in three-year uh, groups so that every year uh, doesn't have to go through the same process on the town level. Um, and so, again, looking for community preservation funds, um, 24, 25, and 26 at um, stable levels. No increase, but remaining stable over those years. Um, I have started conversations with some of the towns and some of the water quality boards. I haven't gotten to everybody yet, um, but we will be in touch over the next month uh, about bringing this before your boards. If, if I can add, Joyce, um, for the benefit of those that, that are new or may not know this, there's an explicit authorization in the Community Preservation Fund for the estuary program to be supported by the Community Preservation Fund water quality section. And the reason for that is, as you might imagine, is the uh, to quote uh, Assemblyman Theo, if there wasn't a, a Peconic estuary partnership that was coordinating federal, state, county, and local town and village efforts, one would have to have been created, and it already now exists. So the strategy here is, how do you fuse together the efforts of local governments and villages, and the needs of both, and as well as some of the available funding to put to together a coherent investment package for water quality at the regional and the local level combined. And that's the justification for for why Joyce is, is outlining this and the statutory support for why it's being outlined. And, and we understand that some of this meeting is going to be the equivalent of, of having been fed by a fire hose. So we'll be following up with uh, all of you uh, uh, going forward in more detail. And we appreciate that this can be a little bit difficult to follow but we'll, we promise we'll follow up. Um, yeah, and I also do want to add, Suffolk County does not um, contribute uh, cash operational funds to the program. Uh, however, Suffolk County does match a portion of the federal award. 
and they um, allow us to work through the Department of Health to um, guide and prioritize projects in the watershed with capital funds, uh, in addition to providing us with a home. Savick County, free of charge, provides us with our offices at the Riverhead County Center. So uh, <coughs> that's a little bit more complicated to put a monetary value on, excuse me, but Sevick County uh, has long been a huge supporter of the program. Um, next slide, please. Oh, and just go back a second, Valerie. So I I'll pause right there for anybody else who might have budgetary questions at this time. Hi, Dr. Novak, Council Member Michael Iasilli. How are you? How are you? Good. So I remember from previous uh, mayors and supervisors meetings when you when you attended, there were some some discussion about budgeting, and you brought up the fact that one of the challenges that you were seeking to overcome was trying to work with the towns, I believe, to make these budgetary allotments more permanent in future years, making them a part of the town budget. Um, uh, per town, how, how ha, have you made any progress on that, and and uh, do you see any ways we can try to work on that together? Um, so that's a really great point. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, there are some towns. The town of Southhold chooses to make this a direct budgetary line in their contribution to the program. They do not use their community preservation funds, but they honor the the amount um, laid out in the proportional table. Um, and you know, at this point, uh, the rest of the towns are contributing directly with CPF funds. Um, and the, you know, the issue of making it a direct budget line is difficult because for some towns, it's really a lot of money, right? So that's, that that's a big piece. Uh, uh, some towns have put together, uh, you know, documents to make the process a little bit easier. Um, and, uh, you know, we're still moving forward with other towns. Uh, it's complicated and difficult because I understand that there's turnover um, when people come in and people go out and they don't understand what happened before. And, you know, we're, we're having this conversation uh, often with town staff. So um, we're not quite there yet, Councilman, um, but I will hope in the next three year time period, we can maybe find a way, whether it's with an intermunicipal agreement um, or with a multi-year agreements that we can achieve that stability. Chris, Great. Yeah. thank you, Joyce. You, you know, <clears throat> I, you know, I could speak, you know, from the perspective of someone who, uh, you know, I sit on the Southampton Towns Water Quality Advisory Committee, overseeing. Uh, some of the the um, CPF water quality funds and uh, up until about two years ago or less rather I had chaired the East Hampton, the, the the sister program in East Hampton town and I could say with with a reasonable degree of confidence that the committees uh, have historically seen value in supporting the uh, PEP and um, and had often asked that the the, the programs um, go ahead and, and fund this um, each year. Um, and then that, and then those are you know, essentially recommendations to the town board and then the town gets to, to choose what they do. But I, I could say with a, a fair degree of confidence that the committees that oversee those CPF funds from a technical standpoint, see the value in continuing to fund this with CPF funds. Uh, Council member Tommy John, is there a way given that you know, get, you know, getting that feedback from Chris, is there a way that there could be a designated allotment from CPF? Not sure if this is, I'm sure this has been looked into. You're muted. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, yeah, I was going to chime in on this and uh, the commitment is certainly there, at least from the town of Southampton and has been for some time. The question is just how to do it in, in a manner that aligns with uh, the budgetary needs of the Peconic Estuary Program. I know our, uh, our our Community Preservation Fund Department is looking into various ways to make this a, a more permanent uh, funding stream for uh, PEP. We certainly support it. It's just it's a question of, you know, how to get over in a timely manner. Thank you. 
Yeah, yeah. Joyce. I, I mean, I, obviously, oh. you know, that one of the one of the reasons for you know the Community Preservation Fund is to support, in my opinion, is to support uh, the work of the estuary program and mm. you know the bodies of water that we all share. I mean, clearly. Yeah, I was going to say, Joyce, um, I can't imagine not supporting this. <clears throat> the amount of success stories that we've had, uh, in, especially in the last two or three years, are tremendous. I think we need to continue to um, broadcast those success, success stories to the public, because um, if you turned your back on PEP, um, if you think that the, the only problem that we have in the conics of, of the scallop issues the issues would multiply tenfold. You know, uh, the fact of the matter is every problem has been identified. Every problem is being worked on scientifically. And, and this is our hope. The PEP is our hope to be able to, uh, to maximize <clears throat> what's happening in the Peconic Estuary. Um, I, I can't say enough good things about your leadership and your staff and um, and what you are attempting to do. I, I think the CCMP is so well thought out. And I, I just think that the goals are realistic. They are, they're targeted goals, they're measurable goals. And I think we're, you know, we're not gonna turn this thing around overnight, but I think we're making great progress and it we couldn't do it without financial support. So the financial support piece is extremely important to, to keep PEP alive and, and the partnerships alive. The partnerships have never, ever been better for PEP. You have close to 100 partners that are now part of the Peconic Estuary Partnership. So it's not just the five East End towns and then some. It, there, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of organizations that are all seeking the same, um, the same goals. So, uh, I, you know, I, my experience here has been I'm, I'm blown away by what we are attempting to do here. And I think we're making some real progress. And I think that we'll continue to make that progress if supported properly. Thank you so much, Jim. Does anybody else have anything to add here? I have a, and just one last thing, Dr. Novak, and, and forgive me if um, this is a little bit ignorant, but, um, you know, just looking at the previous screen on the Peconic Estuary and watershed. Obviously the water, the I'm sorry, the estuary from Gardner's Bay does yeah. sort of flow into the sound. Has has there been any conversations with like Brookhaven Town at all uh, about participation, um, given that, you know, we share the same water body um, and, you know, the various um, impacts uh, could be, you know, uh, it, could, it could be a multitude um, throughout the region. Um, so, yes, when Ed Romain was supervisor at the town of Brookhaven, he was very supportive of the program um, and was open to conversations about financial contribution. Um, and we had had discussions. Um, I don't know if everyone remembers the Fish Pass project at Forge Road, um, but when the grant funding um, ran short, uh, Ed Romaine had moved quickly to give direct budget money from the town of Brookhaven. And um, we kind of felt that that was far more important at the time. So, I mean, Brookhaven has always been supportive with the new supervisor. I am, you know, in the process of reaching out uh, to have that conversation. And I will say I've had the conversation with the Long Island Sound Study, um, also a national estuary program, but they have what we call a congressional carve out. So they get $41 million a year. Um, however, they are not willing to share funds in that way. Um, it is not written into their legislation that they're allowed to do that. Um, so it's far more complicated. However, um, I do meet with them regularly about work that they can carry out that we can then use or benefit from. Um, and so that's a really important way that we can leverage some of that money. But as far as contribution to the program, they're actually not allowed to do that because of the way their legislation is written. That's good to know. I, I would just add just some food for thought. I know that because Brookhaven is councilmatic, um, you know, each of the council districts may in fact have, I think they have their own budget lines where the, for instance, the East End um, districts, such as Council District 6, um, may have 
a specific budget line for water protection or or what you know other community based funding programs and that that might be able to be a strategy for Brookhaven but I'm not sure 100% but you know I am meeting with councilwoman Karen Kesneg from council district 6 I'm happy to bring that up to her to explore that would be great thank you and I will follow up with you about um some more details about that Anybody else? Okay, thank you, Joyce. Okay, so uh, next we have some project updates from the PEP staff. Uh, you know, as Jim touched upon, there's always so much going on. So this is just a snapshot into um, some of our current work. Uh, first, we have some water quality project updates. Um, so we have a project um, ongoing uh, regarding microplastics in the Peconics. Uh, this project uh, is working to quantify microplastics in the Peconics, including sizes that have been undetectable by traditional methods. Um, so very, very minuscule um, pieces of plastic. And uh, the aim is to identify where this marine debris, this, these very small microplastics are coming from. Next, our Reeling in the Next Generation. Uh, this was a fishing program um, partnership with the DEC uh, and PEP, um, and it worked to um, get um, people out in the community, uh, educating them about fishing, um, educating them about uh, water quality issues in the Peconics. Um, and this was geared toward the Spanish speaking community here on the East End. So we did have uh, people that were bilingual translators so that we could clearly communicate um, all of these uh, topics and um, also just have fun. We, you know, taught these uh, kids as well as their parents how to fish, uh, identify different fish species with them. It was a very successful program and it definitely got the group thinking bigger picture about um, these areas that they frequent um, and, you know, all of the different uh, ecological factors that uh, go into just a fun activity like fishing. Uh, so we are looking uh, for partners in the future uh, to uh, work with us in this program um, in order for it to be ongoing. Uh, so if there are any programs out there that are fishing related, uh, bilingual, uh, definitely uh, suggest this program to them and they can go ahead and reach out to us. Uh, next, we have the Peconic Base Gallup Technical Review Committee. Uh, this, of course, uh, the Peconic Bay Scallop die-off is ongoing. Uh, this is an area of study which we will continue. Uh, if you are interested in this, absolutely uh, join our next meeting, March 28th, to stay up to date. Uh, some of the most recent work uh, is working with different genetic strains uh, to see you know, where there are more resistant uh, species. Okay, next we have the Tambar Creek uh, long-term PRB performance monitoring. Uh, PEP is uh, funding monitoring at this site to assess the effectiveness of this perme permeable reactive barrier that was installed here in East Hampton. Um, if you're unfamiliar with the PRB, it is essentially um, a piece of infrastructure that you can put in the ground and when the groundwater flows through it, uh, contaminants can be taken out. In this case, nitrogen. The aim is to reduce nitrogen entering this body of water. Uh, so we will continue to assess the, the effectiveness of uh, this project. Uh, next, we have our water quality app. So the the target of this app is to get all of the different water quality monitoring data that's going on all over the East End and put it in one place. Um, I'm sure as you all know, there is all different types of work going on as far as water quality monitoring and it can be hard to get all of that data. Uh, <clears throat> so we were hoping that getting all of this uh, data in one place will help to make informed decisions. Uh, next, the 2023 State of the Estuary Report. Uh, this report will assess the uh, health of the estuary, water quality, as well as our ecosystems. Uh, and that will be coming soon, so stay, stay posted, or stay tuned. 
Okay, I'm gonna pass it along to Jade for these next updates. Hello, again, my name is Jade Bonnell. I'm the Coastal Resilience and Communities Coordinator for PEP. And I'm just gonna talk a little bit first about those of you who know me, my favorite subject, wetlands. So when it comes to Paul Stoutenberg Preserve, which is a project that PEP has been working on for a while, it is under contract with AKRF and they have been doing some alternative plans to see how hydrological changes will benefit that environment. Um, they recently presented to the trustees and the town, so the town owned property have since chosen the alternative of culvert amendment under, oh, thanks, <laughs> culvert amendment under um, Old Main Road uh, based on the, the hydrological surveys that took place there. They're, they believe that with writing of that culvert and the engineering designs and permitting is now being worked on, um, that restoration of the hydrology will help to fight back the frag issue there and bring back salt water into that piece of land. And that is all in the town of Southold. When it comes to Riverside, so that is in the town of Southampton along our river here, uh, we have BIL funds with which our new outreach assistant, Rachel, is going to be going over a little bit more. But I'm happy to say that the RFP out of the Southampton town has gone out and there have been bids on it. I was given a couple of bid packages that I'm gonna assist in reviewing. That committee I was told is gonna uh, choose a proper bid in the coming weeks. So that's really exciting work that's going on. Thank you, Tommy John. I know that you gave us a quick update on that last time. So that's moving. Um, and something that's really exciting that's happened this past week at Montauk Big Reed Pond in the town of East Hampton, the writing of that culvert for the uh, availability of fish pass, uh, the permit to do that was just received back from New York DEC. The permit goes until April 1st, and luckily our Suffolk County uh, vector control, Tom Iwaneko, local hero, uh, is right on it and is ready to start implementation at that site. So hopefully it'll be ready for fish pass. Um, That's great news. Thank you guys. Absolutely, we're so we're so we were so excited to get that permit back. So, uh, land use ecological uh, has that permit in hand and is ready to assist Tom and Suffolk County, and we thank them for their, they were so speedy in getting to that implementation. Um, all right, so then a little bit more about salt marshes, Valerie. You could hit me to the next slide. Awesome. So on that right side, just to be in relation to our salt marsh elevation tables. We're going to be continuing our yearly monitoring at Indian Island, Cedar Beach, and Hubbard Creek this year. If you did not catch our technical advisory committee meeting back in February, Nicole Marr from the Nature Conservancy gave a presentation on the set monitoring stations all along Long Island. Overall, um, I can send you a copy of that presentation or you could see it on our YouTube page. Overall, she gave the major takeaways of Long Island marshes are not keeping up with sea level rise. And as we face this harsh reality, it really shows how much we need to invest in the infrastructure needed, the hydrological restoration needed, the study and tools for site suitability on what are the best ways to go about this all across the island. Um, I really suggest watching that presentation. Her and Adam Stark at the Nature Conservancy published this paper on suboptimal root zone growth. Um, the combination of sediment accretion at the surface and root zone growth um, are being really affected by the very high levels of nitrogen that we face all along the coast, which we're all very familiar with. That publication also publicly available. So thank you to Nicole Marr. If you have any questions on that, I could talk about it forever. I'm very uh, excited one... about this, Jade. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, and speaking of something that Susan had talked about earlier is at Akabonic Harbor, that is one of the stations that are part of that paper. Akabonic Harbor thus far, um, if, if you haven't heard me yell about this project, which I do constantly all the time, and I'm happy to talk about it at any time, but as Susan said, it started out with that community science mosquito breeding program that identified pooling that was happening in Akabonic Harbor. That project with trustees and uh, legislator Bridget Fleming at the time really brought attention to 
Nicole Marr and her study and connected the hotspots of where real science needed to happen and where we could use that citizen data to direct our funding. And Nicole Marr brought in the SMART teams, the Salt Marsh Adaptation and Resilience teams, which are a kind of a group on the Northeast that is really changing the way that we are thinking about what salt marsh restoration looks like. It's recognizing the history of the land. It's recognizing legacy features that are still changing the way hydro water is flowing throughout our marshes and using it to our advantage when we're planning the restoration of hydrology on a site. So we are working to expand the work that Nicole Marr and her team at the Nature Conservancy have already have brought that workshop of that group from the Northeast, brought them in. They have made plans for a section of Ekabonic Harbor and the next $150,000 of Suffolk County capital funds that we are currently in contract with. Um, we had some, some bumps getting that contract executed, but as I hear as of now, they are still, they're on their way. Um, once that is signed, that contract will expand those designs into Suffolk County lands and East Hampton town lands. It will bring them through permitting of the new ways in which they are going to change this hydrology. We're talking about small runnels and doing uh, lots of field siting to understand what really needs to happen. And it's not large regrading of the site like previous restoration projects would go about salt marsh restoration. So that money is hopefully going to be moving soon. Um, we hope to continue with Nicole Lamar's work of holding a workshop to make regulators, permitters, and our town officials very aware of how this work is different and um, how that hydrological change can really give us the coastal resilience aspects that we're looking for on the marsh. Funny, like I said, I, I could talk about this forever. But funny yes, you brought up you brought up her name, Nicole Marr from the TNC. Yeah. She's been working at Meshamek for the last 17 to 18 years in Bass Creek. And she has collected all kinds of data. I've watched her work right there off the boardwalk uh, going out to Bass Creek. And, mm -hmm. and she has gathered a tremendous amount of information about sea rise and its impact on Bass Creek. I'd love yeah. to be able to share that information if she would share that information with all of us. Yes, so she presented at our last technical advisory committee meeting in February, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that she would love to. She's fantastic. I actually started my Long Island salt marsh career with her on Bass Creek, on Shelter yeah. Island, taking yeah. core samples with her. Um, yeah. She does amazing work. She does. I would just like to say uh, um, she taught me so much over the last six years. The first time I ever walked on the salt marsh with her, I just... Um, absorbed all this information and, and she was terrific and I love the smart teams meetings that we had I learned a lot there as well and for anybody who's the lay person as I am I would highly recommend that if you have an opportunity to um, be in any one of her uh, meetings or you know nature conservancy yeah. pep it's just great so I, I'm eager to see this um, launch and I have volunteered myself to help out in any way that I can on in the salt marsh if possible Thank you, Susan. Oh. Thank Alrighty. you. Valerie, if we're done with salt marshes, you can hit next on this slide, unless anyone else wants to talk about salt marshes. Otherwise, you could always call me. Just call her. She'd love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, and I did want to give an update for those of you who have been following along. We had a partnership with CAS, the Center for Advocacy, Support, and Transformation in the town of Southhold at their headquarters, at their this home that they have where they host all of these active outreach and after school programs. Um, they have put in a native plant garden and it's something that was a special partnership that kind of mimicked our homeowner rewards program, which Valerie is the head up of. And we're hoping to go visit the site. They also purchased all of these, these signs with our PEP logo and is part of their programming for their after school program is now talking about native plants and gardening, which is very sweet. And I think we have one more picture in here on the next slide. Yeah, so that was them planting and we're hoping to go visit in spring and talk to Cast and figure out how we can uh, strengthen that partnership. Nice.
Okay. Oh, so this is our Coastal Watershed Grant, which is administered through Ray Restore America's Estuaries. This was a $250,000 grant that is looking at how do we collect proper data in order to find proper site suitability for eelgrass restoration. When we look at all of the money that we have put into recording and understanding where eelgrass beds are in the Peconics, it's it's not looking good generally. <laughs> so all of our money put towards restoration, we need to make sure that we're doing proper site suitability. And this project, um, I think you could hit the next slide on here, that might help. Yeah, so this project is collecting thermal images. So Joe Tamborski um, from Old Dominion University goes out in a helicopter. He's done this twice, once in winter and once in summer. And goes and takes thermal images of the estuary, those thermal images, then he ground truths using radon surveys, which help him to identify that the different temperature water that they're seeing in the thermal imagery actually is groundwater seepage into the Peconic Bay. They uh -huh. confirm that with those ground truthing surveys, and it's believed that it's these cool refuge areas that are less, are facing less drastic temperature changes are areas where they are more suitable for eelgrass restoration to take place. Once those sites were chosen, they were planted back in June, July, maybe August. Um, okay. Um, once those initial pilot plantings were, were put in, that was done. We ran a couple of outreach events with the SWIMS group from Stony Brook University, the Society for Women in Marine Science. They helped us string together all of our source eelgrass maps. And then uh, the researchers at Stony Brook University and the Brad Peterson Lab for Community Ecology uh, went and planted these discs. And now they'll be monitored. And overall, the main thought about this grant and the reason that our proposal was chosen is that this method could be used for regional change. This grant is specifically about how can you show the piloting of a single method that can be replicated across other estuaries. So we're really excited to continue this work on eelgrass um, and we're hopeful that uh, this last winter flyover is now continuing and the pilot is going to expand with other restoration sites. So we'll keep you updated on any workshops. If anyone's interested in volunteering to weave together some seagrass mats, uh, we'll keep you updated. Uh, <clears throat> Tommy John, did you have a question? Did you re-raise your hand? Oh, I think he's good. Uh, I'm good, thank you. Okay. I'll lower my hand. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Oh, and I did want to mention that Suffolk County, when they went to go do the ground truthing for this and rode around finding those radon samples, um, Suffolk County volunteered boat time to assist in this effort. And uh, we will be presenting, the researchers themselves will be presenting to the Suffolk County legislator, um, the environmental, the Environment Parks and Agricultural Committee will get a presentation on this and keep them updated on how they're assisting our efforts. So thank you. Jade. Yes. Yeah, so I just wanted to eat, um, kind of explain how this effort differs, you know, a little bit, you know, in a little bit more detail about how, from other site suitability experiments. Um, you know, what we've found as an eelgrass person myself, um, you know, what we've found is that there are certain uh, places where you would not expect eelgrass to be thriving, um, you know, like Bullhead Bay or parts of Great South Bay. Um, and it's largely believed that those uh, specific eelgrass communities are there because there is a lot of groundwater flow and the groundwater flow helps keep the plants cooler during the summertime. And so, you know, there's the, the two greatest threats to eelgrass um, here on Long Island, whether it's the Peconic or the South Shore Bays, as well as region wide, the two biggest threats to eelgrass are um, temperature and nutrient loading, right? So, uh, you know, we're up and running on a lot of our nutrient reduction programs. There's not much we can do about the temperature itself. So, this is one of those program uh, research projects where we're looking for those um, groundwater refugia sites, as we call them. 
Um, and then the next phase, a larger regional effort is looking for uh, how do we move seeds around that or, or even potentially uh, genetically modified plants to be able to withstand warmer temperatures. That's a whole different effort that we could talk about some other time. Yeah, and I will note that this proposal does integrate with having the other eelgrass work that we're working on that is mapping out eelgrass and the other uh, regional effort. We plan that this will be informing all of those other um, restoration efforts. And it is a great example of investing in site suitability because these are public dollars that should be used to the best of their ability when we put restoration projects in. So this should surely help in that. I think we're good for the next one. Thank you. All right. So um, I'm also going to talk about the Shoreline Adaptation Initiative. That is a PEP initiative along with New York Sea Grant. I'm working with Dr. Kathleen Fallon on how do we, the question overall is how do we get all of our stakeholders, our community members to have aligned decision-making and understanding of how we adapt shorelines on the east end of Long Island. Overall, we found and have been focusing on our core assessment group up to this point, where we recognize that in every single town functions differently. And we see that especially in meetings like this. And Kathleen Fallon and I sat down with each town and permitting regulating body and had an interview and then held a workshop back in January where we had the trustees and planning boards and people who review permits come together and look at these big maps that we made, um, which you can go to the next slide um, since I'm already discussing this. You can, Valerie, we can skip back. Yeah, so we had them look at these large maps that we made of each of their processes. And if we decided that if we can first get a handle on how is the process in each town for permitting? How can it be changed? How can it be fixed? Where are the hurdles? If we can identify and document hurdles within the town and then their experience in with other jurisdictions, their other legislators with the way that the state permits or the Army Corps permits, how can we first identify these hurdles? Then how can Kathleen at New York Sea Grant and PEP leverage their position and dollars in order to help to fix these and do the most amount of good to the most amount of people? Um, Valerie, if you just go back one for me. That's what our core assessment group has been working on. As of now, we are translating all of that information in that anecdotal data into a spreadsheet to figure out how can we do any type of statistics to show where the real need is felt across different permitting regulators. This project, because it is a big ask to figure out basically how every single town works and their permitting process, we recognize that we have these different branches that have grown out of it. And we need to record and document the experience felt by permitters, the experience felt by contractors and implementers, and the experience of homeowners. There's a, in our project plans, we are then gonna make uh, guiding principles. We're gonna make outreach materials for each of these perspectives, as well as help to liaise with the state on state permitting, which is its own entire, uh, entanglement to figure out. Uh, luckily, we have a lot of help, and on the right side of this slide, it kind of shows this. We're seeing how we have um, a master's student that helped us put together the beginnings of a site suitability model. This week, Kathleen and I have had a bunch of meetings with the state to figure out where is possible funding for technical assistance of a GIS model that will help to narrow down what are proper possible nature-based solutions that can be used on a specific area of a shoreline. Um, these are models that have already been created out of the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. And with proper data and access to data on the local level, we can plug our parameters in there and hopefully create a model that really is beneficial to implementers and homeowners making that initial decision and can help to guide, um, to guide the groups that are permitting so that if the state were to fund that, the state could work with us and have a great understanding of where towns and local local communities are coming from. Um, in addition, 
we're that's part very of exciting i'm so great to, so glad to hear about that oh yes liz i'm so yes so uh, we we definitely have heard and part of that documentation process that i talked about earlier it's important for us to document that there is a need and all of those interviews might have taken a while and that workshop was a lot of coordination but if we can document the need then we can document that this is worth public funds for us to apply for those grants and focus on this. Um, in addition, we are meeting today, actually, New York Sea Grant has a law fellow that is going to come in and help us to review code and zone in relation to the New York State uh, DOS model local laws. We had a group of students from Stony Brook University take their first shot at looking at how our local code and zone relates to the model local laws. And now we're going to work with this law fellow to see from her perspective how things can, can be addressed and where attention needs to be had. Um, yeah, I did want to mention that another branch of this as well is uh, there is a group of Stony Brook stu sustainability students that are open and willing and have lots of time and are extremely eager to help in any way that they can. And one of the aspects that we recognized when we were interviewing um, permitters and regular relators, so in your town, the people who give out permits, if they have any specific questions that they would love guidance on or love a literature review on, on what are other towns doing, they we are open right now to taking questions for that group to work on and give you some cited sources on what other places are doing. These are questions like, how do I choose what parts of my plant list for my buffer zone I need to focus on? So how do I choose plants that are for reducing nitrogen versus water runoff versus erosion control? Uh, at other aspects such as how large should my buffer actually be in order to have the erosion control that I'm looking for or the runoff uh, value that I need. So if you have and your uh, permitting bodies have any questions like that, please feel free to contact Kathleen and I, um, and we're happy to tease that out and try to find the answer for you. I think that's all I have on that, Valerie. And then the last thing I think I have is on the Shinnecock Nation, we had a mini grant uh, project proposal period. Uh, the Shinnecock Nation proposed a sugar kelp pilot um, both in their area in Hampton Bays, on the north side of Hampton Bays, along the Peconic Estuary. Uh, they own a parcel that they call the Westwoods. They were looking to do a sugar kelp pilot project in this area. Um, we are continuing to look through the scope of work for that, but we're hopeful. They completed a co-op for uh, EPA funds use, so they've been working on this. We are still figuring out and finalizing their scope of work and executing our contract for that, but hopefully it is going to move forward. And I think you're good, Val. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you, Jade. Um, okay, so for the sake of time, I'm gonna go through these outreach updates um, pretty quickly, but if you have any questions about certain programs, just raise your hand and I'll, I'll stop and give a more in-depth explanation. Uh, so I'm starting with a recap of uh, our highlights from 2023, although we're, you know, fairly into 2024 at this point. So a lot of these programs have started back up because it's just, you know, a continual wheel of all of this uh, educational goodness going on each year. So last year we hosted 15 in-person events, um, you know, along with countless committee meetings, uh, meetings, webinars. Um, these were all where we got people out enjoying the environment, learning, um, uh, in the outdoors, which is really fun. Uh, some of those highlights we already talked about, um, the Reeling in the Next Generation uh, fishing program, um, alewife surveying. Um, we had um, this middle picture on the bottom, um, an unveiling for the Byron Young Fish Passage at Woodhull Dam, uh, right on Center Drive South on the border of Riverhead and Southampton. Um, that was a really great event, and it was great to honor uh, Byron. For those of you that don't know him, uh, he's a retired uh, DEC fisheries biologist, and he had for a decade or so at this site before the fish passage was put in, um, transported fish in buckets over the dam so that they could make it upstream to spawn. So 
definitely a, a legend in the area as far as alewives go. Uh, next, uh, some some more uh, of these uh, events just, uh, you know, spelled out a little bit more. We have a day in the life of the Peconic Estuary, which is a Central Pine Barrens initiative um, with help from Brookhaven Lab, as well as the uh, New York State DEC. Um, this is a program to get um, school age kids out in the environment, learning, doing science, you know, showing them, you know, what possible careers are in this area uh, by partnering them with organizations such as PEP um, and hopefully uh, making them more curious about what's going on in their environment. Uh, we have our winter watershed walks, um, which we just wrapped up our second season. I'll get more into that. Uh, and our uh, Earth Day Alewife Walk, which is coming up again as well. Uh, Community Science Long Island, our Otter and Horseshoe Crab uh, internship through Stony Brook, uh, and our River Herring and American Eel survey. Uh, for a recap of our homeowner awards program, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, this is a program that reimburses homeowners up to $500 for installing uh, green infrastructure on their properties, including rain gardens, native plant gardens, rain barrels to uh, rain those garden to water those gardens. Uh, and last year we had 18 rain gardens installed and five rain barrels, over 15,000 square feet. Um, of rain garden, native plant garden was installed and this program reopens uh, at the end of this week. So you'll see more about that if you follow us on any social media or our email blasts. Uh, next for our monofilament fishing line collection, uh, you can see on this map all of the different receptacles we have throughout the East End. Uh, here is the breakdown of all of our uh, collections. Last year we do three collections at the end of spring, summer and fall. Uh, you can see that there's way more people out there in the summertime, uh, as you would expect. Um, and we had uh, a new fishing uh, line receptacle in, uh, installed uh, at the Hashimamic boat launch. Uh, and that actually had uh, the most uh, fishing line collected uh, all year. So uh, mm -hmm. definitely a great location to have that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, so some more recent events. Uh, we had our Citizens Advisory Committee uh, trip to Albany, where we educated representatives on uh, the importance of protecting the Peconic Estuary. Uh, so we have some people from this call, us from this trip on the call. Kevin, did you want to say anything? Or he already left us, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> no problem. Uh, Bob, if you are available and you wanted to say a couple words about this trip, uh, Bob is on our steering committee for our CAC uh, and joined us for Albany. Sorry to call you out. No, no problem. Um, first of all, thanks everybody uh, who managed to get up there. It was it's always a uh, you know if you don't do it all the time, it's uh, it's always an enlightening experience. And uh, what people don't realize is that Valerie spent half her time trying to find a place to park the van. So <laughs> Albany's not the easiest place to find a parking space. But anyway, I think we had a really good uh, visit with, and as you can see in the photographs there, a good visit with uh, all of our, you know, local representatives, the state level. Um, PEP guys did a great job of uh, presenting what the issues were and and making the case uh, to support Assemblyman Thiel's uh, recommendation and, and proposal for um, added funding. And obviously, uh, Assemblymember Giglio and uh, and others in the region, you know, were all supportive and, and, uh, and welcomed us. So I think it was a good trip. Um, it's always a little exhausting, but uh, I think it's always worth a journey up there once in a while. You have to remember, you know, uh, people like uh, Assembly Member Glick, new to the environmental, the head of the Environmental Conservation Committee, uh, and Harkman also on the Senate side. You know, these are folks that don't know us as well as people like Steve Engelbright that used to be up there. So um, I think it was well worth the journey. Uh, and certainly thanks to all who attended. And um, I think that's about it. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Um, and this is a uh, something we'll be doing annually. I don't think I have it in me to do it more than once a year, but we should definitely continue it annually. Um, so if uh, anybody would like to come next year, um, definitely contact me. And just wanted to say uh, thanks to Carol again for coming and uh, Assemblywoman Giglio. Thank you so much uh, for hosting us uh, that day. We really appreciate it. It was great seeing you all here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And it was also great um, coming together as a group 
to go up to Albany um, and also to meet some of the other groups that were up there with their concerns um, and a lot of environmental concerns. So uh, it was nice being up there. And Valerie, you were a beast. Um, just so that everybody knows, it was thick fog most of the way up there. And on the way home after the first hour, it was pouring rain and wind. And this woman picked us up, took us there, got us back, and then still had to drive 40 minutes to get home. So thank you again for your tenacity, Valerie. That's very sweet. Thank you, Carol. Um, I was happy to do it. So yes, next year, uh, let us know if you'd like to join. Um, definitely a fun day. Um, okay, uh, so next we have, uh, sim similar to the cast rain garden that uh, Jade has mentioned, uh, we have an ongoing project at the South Hold Junior Senior High School, uh, and si the same type of uh, agenda to bring this green infrastructure project to a school to educate the uh, students about uh, the importance of green infrastructure and native plants and to hopefully mitigate any uh, stormwater runoff issues at the site. Uh, so we are working with the Suffolk County Soil and Water Conservation District for this project. Uh, they're gonna help design it. Uh, we've had some issues with siting um, on at the school grounds. So we are uh, working now to pick a new site for it um, and to uh, complete that this spring. So stay tuned for that. Uh, next, we have another mini grant program uh, by Peconic Baykeeper. Uh, and this will uh, work to track uh, changes in uh, climate change related effects on the Peconic Estuary watershed. This uses a tool called a chronolog, and it sits uh, in a in a static place. You put your phone on it, and you can take a picture uh, of a designated angle. And then throughout the years, you know, with people, you know, taking these pictures, uploading them to the site, you could see the changes, whether it's you know just a flooding event or you know erosion. Uh, so that will help to demonstrate uh, the effects that we are seeing. And the locations have been chosen. Uh, installation is coming later this spring. Uh, we just completed our winter walk series with Peconic Baykeeper. They were hugely successful. Last year, uh, or last season that we did this, we had about uh, six to 12 folks for each uh, walk. This year, our, our last two walks, we had to actually shut down registration because we had 26 people about to come to each of those. Uh, and it was exceeding the permit uh, number that we had. Uh, <laughs> don't tell anybody. I'm um, just kidding. So we were just like five over. But yeah, we had to shut down the registration because uh, so many people were interested. So really glad to see people uh, wanting to get outside during the winter, even when it's a little tough to do so. And we'll be continuing this again uh, next year. Jim, we hope to come out to hash, uh, to Mishamik. So you'll have to join us for that one. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, I had mentioned uh, Community Science Long Island. This is an ongoing webinar series to demonstrate to folks how you can get involved in citizen science opportunities uh, on Long Island. And uh, this year was very exciting because we paired the webinars with an in-person event. So uh, the uh, webinar that uh, I had helped to uh, to organize was the River Herring Update. And we actually have our in-person event coming up on March 23rd at that Byron Young Fish Passage uh, to teach folks how to use the Survey123 app and to just learn a little bit about that Fish Passage project. Oh, and I do wanna say this, uh, this uh, Community Science Long Island is in conjunction with SeaTuck, Long Island Sound Study, New York Sea Grant, South Shore Estuary Reserve uh, slash Department of State, and um, of course, us at PET. Uh, once again, this is that in-person event. If anyone's interested in attending, <clears throat> you can find, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. You can take a little um, picture of this QR code on your camera, or you can go ahead um, on our website, our social media, we have it posted there. And more uh, alewife things. We have an Earth Day alewife walk coming up <clears throat> with uh, Peconic Baykeeper. And this is at uh, Emma Rose Elliston Park. Um, and 
This is a little shot from last year. You see a fish trying to get over that culvert. Um, so that's a very fun walk. Uh, that once again <clears throat> is with uh, Peconic Beekeeper, Pete Topping, if you know him, he's great and a very good person to head up a nature walk. So if you are free on Friday, April 5th, <clears throat> feel free to join us for that. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me, folks. Um, Next, I'm going to pass on to our newest staff member, Rachel. She's going to talk a little bit about our bipartisan infrastructure law funded projects. Hi, everyone. I am Rachel Friedman. Um, as I said, I am the new uh, outreach assistant, and I just started a few weeks ago, so bear with me a little bit. Um, so yeah, I'm talking about the bipartisan infrastructure law project updates. Okay, good enough to the next slide. So here is uh, a breakdown of our projects that are in process as well as you can see the numbers there. So we have the Meaning House Creek stormwater, the, uh, which is also the uh, Broad Cove with the Peconic Land Trust to increase water access. We have the South Hold Goose, Goose Creek discharge elimination, the Sac Harbor stormwater management, the Southampton West uh, wetland restoration and the uh, formerly known as the Blue, Blue Carbon Project, which is now the changes um, in the Eastern Peconic. Go to the next slide. So I'll start with uh, Meeting House Creek, which was identified as a priority for pollution reduction. Um, so we have 5.6 acres of a drainage area and 0.6 acres of constructed wetland. And so the benefits of this um, are to treat the water quality and um, improve wetland biodiversity and also to educate the public. And this is uh, pet funding uh, implemented and Riverhead still needs $175,000 to sign a contract for the bid. For the next slide. Uh, so Broad Cove with the Peconic Land Trust. Uh, this is using BIL year two funds and uh, this is phase one. So um, we are doing invasive species removal and we are also preparing, uh, we wanna in increase access. So we are doing a new parking area, trail improvements and creating signage to help educate people about what's going on and about the area. And so the parking area is currently pending approval from the town. And uh, so now next we're just finalizing the trail improvements and the educational signage. Um, and we are working on the funding for phase two with PLT, Conic Land Trust. Good next. Uh, so the Southhold Bruce Creek discharge elimination, these are the some three of the sites. Um, and we are removing seven stormwater discharge points into the Goose Creek watershed. And um, PEP is funding four of the seven elimination sites. On the next slide. So for the Sac Harbor stormwater control, um, so we have actually our funded our funding completed for the two sites and they're work in progress. We have the um, Havens Beach Rain Garden and the Bay Street uh, permeable pavement projects that are currently being worked on. Go well, next. So the Southampton Riverside Wetland Restoration and Community Access. Um, so the town of Southampton is uh, in 2015, um, developed a redevelopment plan for the future of Riverside community. And part of the project focuses on wetland restoration um, in the identified areas where uh, we feel we need increased water access and of course to enhance climate resiliency um, and PEP funding, conceptual designs and bids are under review. Go to the next slide. 
So the previously called uh, Blue Carbon Project, which is now called the Changes Project um, to reflect the multifaceted approach we are taking, which includes creating habitats, acidification reduction, nitrogen bioextraction, guarding of our shoreline, ecosystem longevity, sequestration of carbon, and we are using these nature-based solutions like sugar kelp, oysters, and eelgrass to help with that. And these are our um, study sites. Um, so I am going to be going out to the site soon. And we have Minute Creek, South Ferry Site, Kennet Creek, Eastern Shore of North Haven, South of Horse Leonard Point, and Sag Harbor Cove. The next slide. So there's a two year commitment, but in year one, we did our site selections. Um, and we did a assessment for the water quality and sediment, which included water clarity, temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, pH, chlorophyll, phytoplankton abundance, and biodiversity. And we want to make sure we knew uh, pick site where shellfish, kelp, and sea gross, uh, sea gross, sea grass <laughs> grow most effectively. Um, and the kelp is in the water now. And we have site visits being planned for the local government and communities. Um, and here we have the picture of the logger for the water quality monitoring. And we also have the uh, oyster reef. And phase two is going to be funded under next year's BIL plan. Yeah. Move on to the next slide. So we are working with the Suffolk County Department of Health on a grant program program to help low and middle income households for maintenance of their installed IA systems. Um, so the South County, Suffolk County legislator has accepted BIL funds awarded and the Suffolk County Department of Health um, has moved forward for setting up the mechanisms to create the grant program for distribution of funds um, and like I said, it's going to be used to maintain the installed uh, systems, which are innovative and alternative septic systems in the Peconic watershed. Um, and again, specifically for households that are in the low and middle income areas um, under the Suffolk County program. Yeah, that is it. So I'll turn it back over to Valerie. All right. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, next, we are going to just briefly touch on some tools um, that PEP has to offer because uh, I do want to leave at least a couple of minutes for discussion at the end. So um, if anybody has any questions on these tools, you can go ahead and follow up with me uh, and I can give a better, more in-depth explanation. Uh, but this is available on our website, our Critical Lands Protection Strategy Tool. And this uh, takes into account climate change impacts, specifically sea level rise um, and adaptation. So uh, this prioritizes land acquisition uh, and can guide protection goals. So it is a GIS la layered map. So you can, uh, you know, plug in different, you know, qualifiers that you want to search for. Um, and it will give you parcels that are uh, a priority to be protected. Um, I have the link on the agenda, but if anybody needs, uh, you can go ahead and email me to go uh, further into that. But uh, this is a great tool for the local governments when you're looking into uh, acquiring land for conservation, uh, whether it's CPF money or otherwise, um, it's a very great tool to use for that. Uh, here's just an example of how that would look when you're filtering out uh, through different uh, qualifiers. Mm -hmm. And uh, next we have our uh, nitrogen BMP tool. Uh, so this tool can be used to, uh, to uh, decide which type of best management practice practice you'd like to go with on any different site. Uh, so which tools you can use, what are the positives, what are the negatives, uh, how much nitrogen they will actually be taking out of the system uh, and the price for that. So I'll quickly click on this. Hopefully this doesn't mess up my whole presentation, uh, but this is what it looks like on the website. Mm -hmm. 
And you could see these are the different uh, tools that you can use. So say we want to look at surface runoff, best management practices. Here you go, it gives an explanation of what that would mean. And then if you say we want to go with rain gardens, view more information, you can actually see advantages, disadvantages, siting, permitting, uh, and the actual cost uh, of the uh, nitrogen. So the cost for the amount of nitrogen, the pounds of nitrogen that you're removing a year. So a good way to analyze what's the most cost-effective way to get the results that we want. Okay, here we go. All right, and uh, this is something that we wanted to share from our friends at the DEC, uh, the LINAP Embayment Water Exchange Study. And this looks at how different water extreme exchange practices could affect nitrogen impairments in embayments. Uh, so different types of embayments and what uh, different types of tools that you can use to uh, promote water exchange. Uh, a lot of this study uh, did show that these water exchange techniques are not necessarily very effective at all in large water bodies like most of Long Island's uh, embayments. There's obviously a lot of detail in that study. You could go ahead and find it on that website. Uh, there also will be a webinar to present the study uh, for sometime early April, and we'll go ahead and uh, send that information around when we get that. Uh, you can, you know, they'll take you, the DEC uh, or the uh, contractor who performed the study will take you through all of the study, the results, and you can ask any questions that you might have, um, how it might relate to your specific area. Uh, okay. So, okay. Uh, so next we have to talk about our local government government committee chair nomination. As I mentioned, uh, Jim has been a wonderful local government committee chair. We can't thank you enough. Uh, and we hope that you'll continue to be uh, involved in PEP, and I'm sure that you will be. Um, but unfortunately, we do have to uh, elect a, or nominate a new chair. So the process for this, uh, if you are interested or anyone, you know, you're interested in nominating anyone, uh, you can go ahead and speak to the town supervisor is usually the person that puts this forward at the East End Supervisors and Mayors Association uh, meeting. The next one is April and Joyce will be attending. So uh, that's when it will be decided. So we hope that there are people that are uh, want to be engaged in this way and want to be that local government committee representation on the management committee. Uh, Chris, do you have anything that you would like to say about this? Uh, not, not right now. I mean, this is, this is really up to the towns. Uh, you know, I think we're looking for someone uh, you know, Jim Colligan has done a fantastic job uh, over the past few years, and I think he could attest to the fact that it, it does bring some great satisfaction to work with the staff and all the other advisory committee meeting um, members to, um, to to get this work up and moving. So I'll, I'll leave it to, to, to Jim, actually, if he wants to jump in. Yeah, <clears throat> it's been a great experience. <clears throat> Loved it. I uh, would encourage uh, other towns to get involved and nominate somebody that is willing to put the time and effort into it. You will not work with better people than the people that, that you have here uh, in PEP today. Um, it's a great it's a great learning experience. I think you can bring a you can learn a lot, bring a lot back to your municipality. Uh, I, I, one of the things that I really wanted to strive for was we speak so much stronger when we speak together as an East End community rather than just the town of Shelter Island or East Hampton or South Old or Riverhead or or uh, or East Hampton individually. So I, I think collectively uh, we form some great bonds together, and I think you know our support of PEP is critical. Um, so I, I I just think it was 
if I had to do all over again, I would do that. You know, I, I, I would jump at the opportunity. It was, it was a great experience and I loved every minute of it. So thank you very much, Joyce, uh, Valerie, Jade, Rachel, who's a new member now. Um, you, you've done a great job. Um, I would like to say that you are in good hands with Meg Larson. Meg Larson is probably one of the smartest, uh, best uh, board members that I've seen come along in Shelter Island in, in, in my time in the last eight to 10 years. Um, Meg is, works with her dad on IA systems. You know, that's her you know, full-time job, but she's a crackerjack. Um, she's a, she is very knowledgeable in water and septic issues. So I, I can't, you're, you're not going to, you're going to get better representation from Shelter Island through Meg Larson than you did through Jim Colligan. So I'm, I'm, that's not pushing her towards a nomination because Meg has been extremely busy uh, doing a, the comprehensive plan here. But when I say she's well-versed in, in environmental issues, she definitely is. And I, I couldn't say enough nice things about her. Um, I do want to comment on one thing that we we said in the past about this simple little thing like fishing line collection. Um, as most of you know, I'm an avid photographer and I spend a lot of time out in the woods and the and the shorelines. And um, one of the one of the worst things I've seen happen since I've been here on Shelter Island was with the death of a snowy owl. Seven or eight years ago, we had a pair of snowy owls actually visit Shelter Island. And um, the male actually got wrapped up in fishing line and froze to death. Oh. And one of our town workers actually found that snowy owl on the beach the next day. And it, uh, I've seen this happen numerous times with, with gulls and other uh, uh, shorebirds, but uh, it just really kind of hit home when you went through that. The other thing I would urge everybody to do is when you attend these meetings, try to you know, it's an hour and a half long. Try to take the top three or four things that really impressed you most about the meeting and at your next town board meeting, report on it. Uh, it's so important to keep your communities abreast of what's happening here with PEP and you are the, your local government representative. And the other thing I would urge you all to do is if, and I think most of you have all done it, we have done it here on Shelter Island, is to invite Joyce and her team out at least once a year to speak about a particular issue that you might be interested in because uh, they do a wonderful job and a wonderful presentation. And I think, um, you know, that that's just something that I would urge every every town member, town board member to try to, to do. So thank you very, very much. Thank you for everybody's support. I've enjoyed it tremendously, but I will try to keep, in, you know, some, some part and staying in, involved with PEP. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah. thank you everyone for joining. Thank you to all of the new folks. Uh, we really appreciate your interest and engagement. Uh, do we have any questions before we wrap up today? Hi, it's it's Jennifer from the county. If we do have if we do have questions, you're such a big group, I don't know who to call. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah so you can you can call me uh because i am the one that organizes the local government committee uh, okay. but if you know it's something particular to a project jade's working on you can go ahead yeah. and call jade okay yeah. okay great i'll probably filter it through you first valerie yeah. <laughs> thanks all right valerie thank you so very very much for your support you you i've seen you've grown in this job <laughs> And uh, you are a tremendous, tremendous addition to PEP. I can't say enough, enough nice things about you. Well, right back at you, Jim. Thank you so much. Um, Thanks for your leadership, Jim. Yes. Uh, thank you very, very much. I appreciate that. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, appreciate the call out. <laughs> now, uh, Meg Larson is a rising star here on Shelter Island. She will be here on the East End, I guarantee you. Wonderful, wonderful lady to work with. I, I will tell you that. You're making me blush. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll end it there with Jim's very kind words. Thank you so much, Thank everyone. You. I really appreciate it. Um, and we'll see you at the next local government committee meeting.
And thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. It was thank great you. meeting everyone. Looking forward to thank working you. with you. Thank you. Thanks thank so you. much, everyone. Great to see you. Bye. Oh, it was very informative. Thanks, Chris. Great yeah, thanks, guys. Talk soon.